There are many things in the practice that we have to learn how to tolerate. Physical pain, unpleasant words. There are also things we are told not to tolerate. Any unskillful thoughts that come into the mind. The Buddha says that we should abandon them, destroy them, dispel them, wipe them out of existence. How do you do that? There are two main ways that the Buddha recommends. He says there are some causes of suffering that go away when you simply look at them. These are the ones that you indulge in, not really paying attention to what you're doing. But if you stop and look at what you're doing, you realize that this is stupid, this is ridiculous. And that's enough to let them go. There are others, though, that are not so obviously ridiculous. Those are the ones that you may know are unskillful, but part of the mind really likes them. And so you've got a battle in the mind. And that's the area where the Buddha says that you have to exert fabrication. Now we know the different kinds of fabrication. There's the breath, which is bodily fabrication, directed thought and evaluation when you set a topic in mind and then you think about it, ask questions, make comments. That's verbal fabrication. And then there are perceptions and feelings. The labels we put on things and the feeling tones we have. Pleasant, unpleasant, neither pleasant nor unpleasant. Those are mental fabrications. And those are our tools, those are our weapons in our internal battle. Over those thoughts that come into the mind and just seem to hang on because there's part of the mind hanging on to them. It's like a John Lee's comment about food. We are the ones who are attached to the food. If there's a plate of rice and we don't eat it, the rice doesn't cry. We're the ones who cry when there's nothing to eat. So there's an internal battle, and that's not won simply by watching. Although watching may be one of the steps. After all, when you really can't figure out what's going on, one of the best things to do is say, I'll just sit with this for a while. But in sitting with it, you're creating an identity in this committee you have in the mind, the identity of the watcher. And you're going to hold on to that. This inner observer, the more solid you can make it, the better you are. Because it helped you get through a lot of things. And John Mahabua talks about how after John Mun passed away, he stopped to think what was the lesson he learned from John Mun that was most valuable, that saved him from lots of misunderstandings in his practice. He remembered a piece of advice when something comes up that you're not sure of, whether it's good or bad, just go to the nowhere inside, the sense of awareness itself. Stay there, and whatever has come is going to pass. Now, in that case, he's probably thinking about realizations that come in the course of the practice that may or may not be true. But it applies to things that you know are unskillful as well, but you don't understand why the mind still goes for them. So you watch for a while, but it's watching with a purpose watching to figure out where will this part of the mind that likes the unskillful thinking show itself for what it is, show its stupidity. Now, this observer is something you put together. It's protected by a perception, and there's a background running commentary basically telling you, stay right here, stay right here, just watch. And it's one of the roles you take on as you try to establish the meditator as the powerful member of your inner committee. But it is a temporary measure. It 
Sometimes you see things for this, but you're doing it for the purpose of figuring things out. Jamahabur, when he defines insight, says it's exploration. You're trying to figure things out. Look around. When the Buddha talks about seeing the origination of something unskillful, that requires that you look around in what places that you might not expect to see things. But you look. What comes together with that thought? What comes together with that mood? When the mood passes away, when the thought passes away, what else passed away in the mind? That requires some active observation and not just passive observation. And you can ask questions. A certain attitude comes into the mind that seems to be an enemy to the meditation. Ask yourself, where did that attitude come from? Who might I have picked that up from? Just as a way of separating yourself from it. It's only when you see yourself as separate from these things and don't say, well, this is my thought and this is my mood, that you can actually see them for what they are. Now you can tell yourself, okay, I will not have any sense of self around this. But all too often, in cases like that, your sense of self, the identity around these things goes underground. So you have to be really observant, ask questions. Be inquisitive. And this is how we understand suffering. We comprehend it by being inquisitive. The Buddha says we suffer because of our clinging. How are we clinging? These thoughts come into the mind, and a large part of you doesn't like them, but another part does. Well, what is the part that does? What is the part that holds on to them? And why? It's when you can see that, that you can begin to dig out the causes of the suffering and abandon those. Because remember, you don't abandon the suffering, you abandon the cause. What's the desire that underlies that particular type of thinking? Sometimes you think, well, this is a thing, thinking I don't like. It's worrying, worrying me, driving me crazy with worry. Why would I like to worry? Well, there's part of the mind that feels responsible when you worry, feels virtuous. That's part of the allure. Because that's what you're looking for, of course. After seeing the origination and the passing away, you want to see the allure. Why do you go for this? Can you compare the allure with the drawbacks to the point where the mind really does admit? Well, yes, on its own. It admits on its own. Not because it's a good meditator, but because you really see for yourself. This really does make no sense at all, this type of thinking, this mood that I've been obsessed by. So exerting fabrications. Sometimes it means fabricating a sense of the knower, just to know what's going on. It also means learning how to have a conversation inside, ask questions. That's the exploratory part of the insight. Ask questions that are glancing, in other words, that come from the side. Questions that your defilements might not expect. Those are the ones that reveal things. Because, as the Buddha said, it's only through discernment that we cut through these things. Mindfulness is like a dam, holds things in check for a while. The ability to watch something, hold yourself back, not engage in it, that holds things in check. But it doesn't solve the problem. The solution to the problem comes from insight. And insight is often unexpected, so ask some unexpected questions. Surprise your defilements. Catch them off guard. There was a poet, John Keats, who talked about having negative capability, the ability to be with things and not ask questions, not try to figure them out. And all too often the practice is depicted as a kind of negative capability. And to the extent that we watch things when we don't understand them, it's something like that. But that's only part of the 
a solution. The other part is more active, proactive. Simply that there are times when the mind is too weak to do anything but try to hold itself back, not in, indulge in its unskillful thoughts. Or as I said, when it just doesn't understand what's going on, that's when you're quiet and watch. Have the humility to be willing to watch. But also have the humility to realize that you're not going to out outwit your defilements that way. You have to engage the active part of your mind, because only when you figure these things out can you get beyond them. <laughs>